I open tonight's work session. Uh, it is April 20th, 2021. Brenda, can I get a roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner uh, McGill, McGinley, I'm sorry. Present. Commissioner Coidula. Here. Commissioner Salazar. Present. Commissioner Bergen. Here. Commissioner Gill. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. So tonight we have one item on our agenda and uh, Sandy is the staff on that item, but it's featuring our very own Commissioner Gill. So Sandy, take it away and welcome back. Yes, so I don't need to provide much introduction. You are all familiar with Commissioner Gill, but I'll just add as a personal note, I actually met her before she joined the Planning Commission when I did a little short stint um, working at the state um, before taking this job at Springfield. So I um, was happy to see her in the, her context of working on, on historic preservation and um, learned that she's very passionate and knowledgeable about this topic. And so excited to have her join us on the Planning Commission. She's also served on the Historic Commission for the City of Springfield in the past. And so has done um, a lot of work to bring her expertise to our local uh, community uh, where she grew up. So uh, unfortunately, as a city, we have limited resources. So I'm not sure how much of what she talks about tonight we can actually implement at least immediately, but it will certainly give us food for thought. And um, there might be opportunities for us to incorporate some of um, her suggestions into our future work program. As uh, Brenda said, Ken Vogany is on the um, meeting and he is our emergency manager. So he is um, taking advantage of this opportunity to learn more uh, about uh, the topic. So with that, Commissioner Gill. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so thanks for your interest, commissioners. I appreciate you um, being willing to hear about this process. Um, so let me start my share. So in my work with Oregon Heritage, which is part of Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, <clears throat> we work with all kinds of heritage resources. Uh, historic buildings are part of it, and our office includes the State Historic Preservation Office, but we also work with historic cemeteries, museums, archives, kind of any historic resource that comes to mind. <clears throat> and so we have for about the last 15 years, been really trying to work on disaster preparedness for these historic resources. And um, we made some good headway, but we realized that we could do better. And so we came up with this project. So I'm gonna share with you tonight um, a, a example, sort of a pilot project we did with the city of Cottage Grove to develop a community disaster resilience plan that's, it, it includes all of the heritage resources in that community, rather than having them take on their disaster preparedness on their own. So we're gonna talk about why this place and who the partners were involved, um, just so you can get a sense. We, we wanted a really good model, uh, an example for other communities to use. And we also created a guidebook to help other communities use this model. Um, we developed a disaster resilience approach uh, that I'll go into a little bit more. We um, did the plan with Cottage Grove and created this guidebook. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we can talk about how this can be implemented and also how, can it, how it can be stolen for other resources, not necessarily heritage resources. And feel free to interrupt at any time, pop on your screen or or whatever to ask questions. So why a plan for heritage resources? Uh, heritage resources, historic places and sites are not immune to disaster. In fact, they're kind of even potentially more at risk <laughs> to disaster than other resources in the community. 
They are crucial contributors to the economy and livability of a community. Resilient organizations are more effective and have greater impact. And that means all the organizations, like as a community, we in Springfield should wanna have all of our organizations that provide, that are an asset to the community to be resilient and be able to bounce back quickly. And we're all super familiar with this right now, um, living over a year with COVID, um, dealing with the fires that happened and then ice storms that happened and last year's snowstorms. So we've been, we've been close to this for a while now. And then the really big point that our organization um, wants to make sure that we talk about is the value of heritage in a community in recovery. So heritage resources provide an anchor. It's a pl their places, <clears throat> there's information and that, that is a shared valued asset in a community. And when a community suffers a disaster and all of those historic features in a community are lost, it is harder for that community to be resilient. Um, and those organizations have a real role in community recovery. They provide the anchor um, for people to ground themselves to when there's so much loss in a community. They provide an explanation for the way the community is and who was impacted and why. They can be a resource for telling their own stories of their experience. Um, they also provide historical information that can inform how the community develops again and replaces what was lost. So they are really an asset. In fact, there was a UNESCO report in 2018 that talked at depth about the value of heritage resources in city recovery and resilience. <clears throat> so for example, uh, in Talent, uh, one of the communities that was deeply impacted by the wildfires, the Talent Historical Society was one of the buildings that was preserved. Uh, it survived the fire and its collections survived intact. And that organization, um, there's two kind of poignant stories, I think, that show an example of um, the value of this organization for this community. The first one is that they had recently partnered with three um, local Latino organizations to put together a, a display of altars about Dia de los Muertos. And so community members brought their items into the museum and had them up for this exhibit, much like the, our library has done uh, the last couple of years. And um, those items were in the exhibit when the fires happened. And several of those families that had items in the exhibit that are personal um, they're about their people who have passed, um, actually lost their entire homes. And because their meaningful objects were in the museum at the time and the museum survived, those objects survived. So um, that's pretty meaningful for them and, and to feel that connection to the community that their, their uh, cherished items had value for the community to recognize. Since the fires, the Talent Historical Society has startled, started an oral history project with the middle school and the middle school students are collecting oral histories of people in the community to um, collect what happened to them and capture the story of the fires and how that has impacted people in the community. So a little bit about us and why, the, uh, why this project. So as I mentioned, we'd been working for years on helping museums and historic sites, historic properties and downtowns. Um, we also have the Main Street program in our, in our uh, office. We were working with individual organizations and we found success developing a plan that was uh, available for the response to a disaster, but uh, but not a plan that would help create action items that they could do to make the the risk less 
um, make the results of a disaster less of an impact on their organization and make them more resilient. So we weren't getting that piece of the puzzle. Uh, but we did see all the local communities and the, and the county level efforts of people working together to do that at a city level and a county level. And we realized that might be a good way to go. So these are some of the things that we have been able to provide in the past. And we decided to take all those together and try to create a community-wide plan. And here's why. One reason is we realize that people are more accountable if they have to answer to somebody else. So I don't know about you all, but it's taken me quite a few years to put my own personal disaster kit together. And frankly, it was in pretty decent shape, but when the fires happened, it got in way better shape. <laughs> so um, if we have multiple organizations who are working on a project and a plan together, they're kind of beholden to each other to meet deadlines and to do decision-making and those kinds of things. So accountability was a big one because it's so easy to put off disaster planning and preparedness. The comprehensive approach we also think was important um, for this. But also one of the big ones is leveraging resources. So finding out those shared needs and then going after those together um, for going after resources together that might uh, serve the needs of more than one organization at the same time. Uh, it helps identify shared strengths and weaknesses um, that might be accessed and, and supported in other ways. And so then it really does bring the community together. It also, we realized after doing this process, it builds community awareness for all of these organizations. It helps bring more attention to heritage resources in the general disaster planning of the community. Um, a lot of folks know in their heads these historic places like Good Pasture Bridge, for example, um, that was uh, handily protected by firefighters but nobody planned that. They just knew inherently that that was an important place, also important for transportation um, and evacuation uh, reasons, but also for the historic reasons. So um, we felt like this might be a good approach that would help these organizations move forward better in their disaster planning and mitigation work. Why Cottage Grove? So we have a program called the Oregon Heritage All-Star Community. This program is for organizations who really value their historic resources or for cities, communities that really value their historic resources and view them as assets in their community. And they get benefits, they get some grant funding, they get technical assistance. And Cottage Grove is one of seven in the community. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the Certified Local Government Program, the Main Street Network. Um, there are a variety of organizations in Cottage Grove. So they have a Main Street Network down there, uh, which Springfield used to have, but we um, aren't involved in Main Street anymore. Um, they have a preservation plan. They have a hazards mitigation plan, and they were willing to give it a try, which is pretty cool. So here's the list of our all-star communities in the state. We only have seven at this point. Um, you, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say. So uh, for all-star communities, we have 23 criteria, a community meets 15 of those 23, and then they are eligible to be an all-star community. They get a logo, and then like I said, the technical assistance and the grants. So having a museum, having a preservation program, having a photo archive, historic cemetery. So there's a broad list um, that people, that communities can work toward to achieve that. <clears throat> the Certified Local Government Program is a historic preservation program. Currently Springfield is a certified local government. They get grant funding from the State Historic Preservation Office to implement the preservation program. Um, in Springfield, the focus has largely been on the Washburn Historic District, but the purpose of the program is for the community-wide historic resources. And Cottage Grove is a certified local government. And as I mentioned, there are Main Street uh, Network as well. We have 64 
um, of the top three tier communities in Springfield uh, engaged in Main Street. I mean, in Oregon engaged in Main Street. So City of Cottage Grove, the Historical Society, the museum, the Bohemia Mining Museum, the Genealogical Library, and the Main Street Organization, in addition to the city, were partners on this project. And our other partner was the Institute for Policy Research and Engagement at the University of Oregon. Some of you may be familiar with them. They do a lot of planning support in the state. They are in the know and work closely with um, Department of Land Conservation and Development in particular in disaster planning and preparedness, but in lots of other ways. So we knew they would be a great asset. So now what we did <laughs> with all that groundwork in place, what we did uh, with students in the, um, in the U of O program was develop a cultural resilience framework. So what we did was kind of merge together the value of heritage resources and their needs together with a regular planning process together with disaster um, resilience planning and management. So we kind of merged these together to create this framework, which the way it's laid out here, it looks like it's in order, but it's really all of them kind of coming together. So looking at what are the, what are the basic operations, right, of these organizations, what are their basic needs? And then looking at disaster risk, which is a typical approach, taking on these resilience principles, which are related to communication, evaluating procedures and making sure that they're functional in, um, in an emergency and how to make information available. And then typical emergency management um, practices about um, preparation and mitigation and uh, improving the situation for an organization. And then finally, um, DEI practices, so diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that those are in consideration all the way through the process. So again, this is sort of another way to look at this framework. We have the resilience principles, so being ready to think about what the possibilities are, having the ability for an organization to adapt. So for example, this is a, this, most of these organizations are quite small. And so they have a decision-making process where the chair of the board and the vice chair have to be together to make anything happen. But in a disaster situation, those two people might not be available at all. And if they are, they might not both be available. And so what in a disaster decision, is in a disaster is the decision-making process so that they can actually make decisions and move forward. So that's just an example of that sort of adaptability and being able to respond. Um, including meeting people of many different identities uh, in this process for building resilience is really critical um, for this work and to be successful and to make sure that these organizations can serve everybody through a disaster situation. And then again, the emergency management, the basic work of emergency management, which is the mitigation and the preparedness, response and recovery. So the mitigation is trying to do the work so that there's less damage in case of an emergency situation. Um, the preparedness is having your stuff ready in case it happens, like your go bag. Um, and then the response is sort of that immediate, like the disaster's happening now, let's pick up our stuff and run. Um, and then recovery, which is kind of what we're seeing happen now, uh, both with COVID and the wildfires. So in order to um, show you kind of the process we did in Cottage Grove, I'm gonna go through what's in the guidebook because it's exactly what we did. Um, first, we looked at the risk profile. There's sort of three sections. So there's the, the risk and the development of the, of the project, 
there's the action items and like putting the plan together. And then there's the plan implementation. So the first section includes these things. And the missing link is that talking about the value of heritage resources. And I would say when you think about this, how it could apply locally, um, it could be any sort of similar resource. So it could be recreation resources, right? They might have shared needs and um, value. <clears throat> or um, it could be fully cultural resources. So it might be historic, but also um, arts and cultural resources could be options. So the missing link conversation is what's that value statement? So the first steps, kind of like any planning process, it's this is this is the planning process. So establish a planning committee. In this case, we needed participants from each of those organizations, but we also wanted some community participants because they care about these resources. Um, then we assessed the situation for these organizations, uh, set the priorities, and then develop the plan. <laughs> and we did this over um, a group meeting. We had about three group meetings. And then the individual organizations developed their own individual plans, which they brought together to create the community-wide plan. One critical thing about both getting your diverse group of stakeholders and keeping this moving forward is having some sort of project champion. And that can be a volunteer, can be a city staff person, it can be a staff person of the organizations that are participating. <coughs> Sorry, I'm suffering from the allergy situation. Uh, so really you need a project champion to keep this moving forward. We uh, did the plan part the community-wide plan, once the individual organizations had their individual plans, um, that was two meetings worth. So it was, it was pretty good. The public engagement part for this and engaging um, stakeholders, City of Cottage Grove has um, put a survey in the water bill, which goes out to everyone who has water in City of Cottage Grove. So um, there was a public survey there were interviews uh, with each of the organization or members of each of the organizations as well. Um, and then there was one public meeting. So um, let's see. So one thing we noticed in this first phase what, when we were looking at what the situation was and also um, building this process were, were two things. One was that these organizations had only been talking with each other a little bit. And that's a pretty small community. And frankly, there's a lot of overlap between these organizations, but they really thought that the process of, of creating this plan was one of the most valuable pieces because they developed stronger relationships and they want to maintain that. The other thing that came out in this process is something that I mentioned earlier, which is it's really important um, to recognize that strong organizations are resilient organizations. And so a lot of the, the goals that they ended up coming up with were basic nonprofit organizational management things that they realized they were lacking in that will help them overall, but also be more resilient. So then the next section is really about developing the plan itself. So again, really reaching out broadly about who should participate in this. And so it might not be your board members of these organizations. It might be somebody who works in the collections all the time or somebody who takes care of the facilities. Those are people that are gonna understand the needs and the risks for those resources. Um, and then look at the opportunity to build long-term partnerships in this that might have a future in also the disaster response situation. So perhaps you partner with a particular class at the high school. And then if a flood is coming, uh, you can recruit that class to come take stuff up off the floor. 
So thinking long term about who should be at the table and, and who in the community could be engaged in different ways. So then we um, looked at the organizational, I said the organizations each did their own plan. So they looked at their people, places and things that were critical and their management practices and essential functions. And then on the community level, it was the hazard identification, the asset inventory, what are all those historic assets and their needs, and then setting their priorities for preservation. And then when developing the action plan, they really focused on actions. So this is a, this is a plan that's gonna get implemented. They are looking at, we need to do this thing and we wanna do it at this time in this way. Um, they, for the community-wide plan, they looked for items that were shared by at least two or more organizations. And then they used that cultural resilience framework to, to help set the priorities. So here's an example of the plan in Cottage Grove. So one of their issues is about um, location of storage of all these historic resources that they have. Um, and there, it could be that in the future they develop one big storage that they could all share in some way, but they found that they needed to understand some basic stuff. What are the responsibilities of the city in caring for some of these properties. Some of them are owned by the city, but managed by the organization. So they set up the priority, where it fits in the emergency cycle, if it's a long-term goal or a short-term one, um, what resources are it would take. So if it would take money, that would be in here as well, how hard it is to do, and then which organizations need to do to do that. And then of course, we wanna make sure that the plan happens and on a community level that it's updated, right? So that they're putting it to work, <clears throat> but also checking in on it regularly. In the city of Cottage Grove, the city council adopted the plan as a sub plan to their disaster mitigation plan. And they are in the, they're hopefully will be in the process next year of updating their disaster hazards, disaster hazards mitigation plan. So they will um, more fully incorporate it at that time. But it could be a standalone plan. It could fall under a preservation plan. Um, there are many ways that it could be adopted and implemented. Also, the individual organizational plans uh, could also be um, done just as standalone, and those organizations could adopt those plans. Because they partnered together, the individual organizations also adopted the community-wide plan, so they all have buy-in. And then definitely celebrate. Uh, I like to have a good party, and if you can put a theme on it, that makes it even better. So definitely recognizing the successes, sharing with the community the results. Um, they've already received grant funding for a couple of their projects that they have on the list, so that's pretty neat. Um, this was started last September and was complete in August. And then this is what the guidebook has in the appendices. There's templates for every single meeting, um, sample agendas, there's sample templates for the individual organization plans and the community plans, um, activity advice, all kinds of things. Um, it's an amazing set of resources. Um, as I mentioned, Cottage Grove adopted it as a standalone, as a subplan. actually. I didn't update this because I did not uh, remember that this was on here. But already um, they're implementing some of the action items. This has also been presented to staff at the Department of Land Conservation and Development and Oregon Emergency Management. They're really interested in getting these historic resources incorporated in the larger plans. Um, they are often left out, but they um, are still pretty critical resources in a community. And um, we are also talking, I think I already mentioned that it could be applied in other ways, not just heritage resources, but it also can be applied to um, the community owned 
So I have state agencies on here. So DAS owns a bunch of historic properties. They could do this disaster planning for all their historic properties. Um, city of Springfield owns a couple of historic properties so they could do it internally as a city entity as well. Um, but also these broader organizations that have kind of statewide historic resources um, might be able to steal a little bit of this and, um, and take it a, a little different direction. So that is what we did. I can quit sharing now. It always moves to the top. Thank you, Commissioner Go. That was so comprehensive and it's exciting to see that the, that the state is running such a program and even more exciting to be reminded of the valuable perspectives that we have on this commission. Um, just tonight, we have you with your historical expertise. Commissioner Salazar has nonprofit affordable housing development expertise. Commissioner Coyvla knows more about engineering than any of us will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> And we have Commissioner Bergen who understands more about the realty market than we'll ever know. So it's just exciting. And I wanted to open up the floor for some questions. I'll get us started, I guess, to break the ice. Um, so I went on the webpage um, for the, the All-Star program information. And I did see that for, for cities to be recognized, they must have 15 of the 23, 23, 22 criteria. Um, and that can be a bit of a hurdle, but I did also see that there was an interest form that cities can submit to receive technical assistance um, if they have at least 10 of the criteria. And I read through the list and know for certain that we have five, I guess that we have maybe eight, um, but are you, can you give us an update on where our community stands and, and which one of the criteria are, you know, the, the more affordable, feasible options during a time where staff capacity is pretty tight? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we have a museum, so that covers one. We have a photo archive in that museum we have a historic records archive in that museum. So the museum by itself covers three of those. Um, City of Springfield is a certified local government. So we have a preservation program and that meets one. And then the other one that that helps meet is that we have an inventory of historic resources. So there's five already. Um, historic cemeteries is one and we do have at least two historic cemeteries within the city bounds um, uh, for historic uh, interpretation. Um, our friends at Willamette Lane are killing it with all of the path interpretation and um, what's happening at, um, at uh, um, Doris Ranch. <laughs> this is keeping me. So those are some um, so we're quite close with a lot. There's some heritage tourism kinds of uh, categories. There are telling um, untold, underserved stories. Um, efforts that could be uh, included in some of that public interpretation that we're doing. I think some of the public art that reflects uh, Springfield's heritage could, um, like the McKinsey Riverboat and the um, the flower grinding one and the logging one, those are all about Oregon's history. Um, so those could meet one of the categories. So I think there's there's possibility if there's interest in the in the city of doing that. Thank you. Do other commissioners have questions or comments? Commissioner Salazar. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation, Commissioner Gill. Um, I'm also interested, I had a question about the, um, the all-star communities and the potential grant funding that may be, that we may be eligible for if we qualify to be an all-star um, community. And especially if, if some grant money might be available to help kickstart some of these conversations around bringing organizations together towards having these, these um, conversations or even if 
if we could start having these conversations without needing to, to infuse money into the project. Sure. So um, the small the grant program is pretty small right now. It's every other year. Uh, it's ranged from three to five thousand dollars, but it has it's very wide open. It's to help achieve the goals of or maintain the criteria. So if a community comes in at 15 of the criteria and they have a couple of more they want to do, then they can use it to fund that or they can use it to maintain those criteria. Um, if a community comes to us and they have interest in the program, um, we can provide some technical assistance to facilitate a conversation about what it, what it means and the benefits that come with it. And then um, sort of exploring the other criteria that aren't already achieved to um, sort of set priorities and think about how those uh, criteria might fit with other goals that the city has or other goals that other entities in the community have. Um, I would view the library and the museum at, at, and Willem Lane, all three as really important um, allies in this because they do a lot of this work already. So we can definitely help on the technical assistance side and facilitate meetings and do some goal setting and, and that kind of stuff. Commissioner Quibla. Uh, yeah, a couple of comments. Um, it, sometimes, you know, you see communities that really don't seem to value their heritage. And um, then you get to a community that does something like they preserve their original courthouse or something like that. And, and uh, you know, it, it's really remarkable to see it. Uh, and I think that um, sometimes the history of places is rather underappreciated. A couple of things come to mind um, in Springfield that I, unfortunately were both lost, and I, I, I kind of considered an interesting history. One was the last smoke teepee for uh, kiln drying wood was torn down uh, around South uh, 42nd Street at about Daisy. And that was an, an interesting uh, old piece of um, industrial logging that was lost. And the other thing that was kind of interesting here in town was um, there was never an acknowledgement of uh, holly farming, uh, that there was a, quite a holly farming industry in uh, Springfield and the area that uh, packaged holly and sold it to um, the holiday markets throughout uh, the United States. And uh, of course, one of the last holly ranches that we had was over on uh, uh, over toward I-5 and uh, Centennial that was torn down and the subdivision that was put in was named Holly Park. So just a couple of observations. I will add that the Historic Commission over a couple of their grant cycles because they also get access to grant funding every other year um, completed um, to <clears throat> two periods of time of historic context for the logging history in Springfield. And they found a couple of mill houses. Um, the Roseboro office is certainly, I almost guarantee eligible for the National Register. Um, it's very much like it was originally and they wanna keep it that way because it's wood <laughs> and that's their industry. So, um, so yeah, there is a lot and you'd be surprised at all the little details that still remain of Oregon's logging history and, um, and it's still part of who we are today. So, and one of, one of the diverse parts of who we are today. Sandy, I wanted to see if you had anything to add about efforts that are currently underway with the historic preservation program and potential opportunities that are coming up in the future. So I don't know a whole lot, um, but what occurred to me as I was listening to this presentation is that I should have invited Maddie Phillips, I think is her name with the um, museum. And so I think I will send her a link as well as Emily just blanked on her name from the library. What is it? Emily. David. Yeah. And so send it, it wrong. Anyway, um, send it to the museum and library folks. Um, 
and suggest that they listen into this uh, meeting this evening and be able to see uh, Curry's presentation in our discussion. Um, I don't have anything else to say. Um, you know, Jim Donovan and um, Drew Larson do staff the Historic Commission, but I haven't been to one of those meetings in quite a while. So I don't know what all they're doing or not doing. I, I really don't know about that. They have a relatively newer, a majority of the members of their commission are relatively newer. Um, and so there's going to be some training um, for them. I think their next meeting will end up being a training meeting kind of in the role and historic function, like code and other functions of the historic commission. Um, and so this um, this type of you know process is definitely within their role. And I think um, this is being recorded. So hopefully Jim and Drew can watch this um, at some point before we do that training. Thank you, Christina. And I saw Commissioner Puebla had his hand up. No? Nope. Okay. I was going to suggest that the historic commission be contacted. But. All right. Any other questions or comments? I'll just make one more comment. And that's something I heard a lot from Chief Heppel. Uh, well, he's acting chief uh, fire chief for Eugene Springfield fire. And um, so he was on the scene during the holiday farm fire and his crew was working to save the school in um, Blue River. And so I don't know that the school's historic, but I think it's the point that Commissioner Gill was making in terms of that school being really the community anchor that will bring that community as a, both a physical place, but also, a, I mean, you didn't say spiritual, but that's how I'm thinking about it. You know, that spiritual cultural identity of the community that was saved. And so the, um, Chief Heppel was saying, you know, very early on that that is really going to be what allows that community to recover and provide that resilience. And so I think that really stood out to me as a point of identifying those priorities. And some of it is instinctual um, and some of it needs to be more intentional, but it, as a way to um, think about the resources that will be necessary to help that community recover it in the face of disaster. Absolutely, thank you, Sandy. Um, so thank you for a great presentation tonight, Commissioner Gill. Um, Sandy, did you have any staff announcements or anything else I've to been add? on vacation, so. <laughs> um, I don't really have much of an update other than to, I mean, if you, haven't been watching the news or paying attention too much. Um, the Springfield Economic Development um, Agency, CETA, has been considering two proposals for Glenwood and they are meeting on April 26th to have further discussion. And I think that will be um, interesting to um, hear about. That meeting will be an executive session. So unfortunately no one from except staff um will be able to attend but if there if if anything moves forward then they would make a decision at a later time in a regular session yeah but it is it's an um exciting time to see what the options are also on april 26th CETA will be discussing a pre-development loan for a new development in downtown springfield um, next to the Buick dealership, this sort of touches on historic um, assets, not the actual Buick building that is the, on the National Register, but the vacant lot next to it, um, redevelopment of that. The city, um, CETA staff have worked with the property owner, the Schur family, Robert Schur, and then a Portland developer to create an MOU for developing an eight-story building on that property. And so that's um, other good news. And that'll be, so they'll be moving forward with a develop pre-development loan, so all the planning work for that um, at the CETA meeting on the 26th. And that is an open session. That's not an executive session. Great, thank you. Exciting times in Springfield. 
All right, with that, it uh, looks like we'll end early tonight, um, but we have a lot to think about, and I think especially to, to look for next time we're walking around our city to see if there's something we've missed before that's pretty special and hasn't caught our eye yet. Um, oh, Commissioner Qu Quibla, go ahead. Uh, were we going to take um, uh, um, reports of council sessions tonight or not? Does staff have preference with that? It's, it's up to the commission. Commissioner Quayle, did you have a report this year? I sure did. Okay, and, and it, it, has something, it has something to do with the CETA decision too. So I, I attended a pretty marathon city council work session, regular session, and a session of the CETA on the 20th. And uh, the work session uh, budget committee interviews, um, CIP review update, so the uh, um, construction uh, that's planned for the future. Um, let's see, uh, the regular session um, ended up having a little thing about a property sale up near the uh, Springfield Flame uh, that's gonna be sold to a developer up there that's kind of what land isn't needed for the Springfield Flame up at uh, Gateway and uh, Beltline. And then the CETA, hotel, uh, CETA session uh, discussed uh, two separate proposals. There were originally three. Uh, one included the Eugene Emeralds uh, relocating, and they decided that the property wasn't large enough to have uh, the Eugene Emeralds um, located there. So it came down to two different essential um, uh, dis uh, proposals. The first I'm going to call the hotel proposal, which anchored with, with uh, would be anchored with a 20 story high hotel and a lot of housing around there, um, both market rate and a fairly substantial number between uh, up to 274 um, affordable homes. So pretty, pretty nice sign on that. Um, they would be looking at entirely funding the process through uh, a new uh, tax program through the federal government that allows people who have large capital gains to reinvest them back into um, community areas that uh, are below a certain income level. And um, then they, uh, or if they hold their investment in that property for up to 10 years and they pay no capital gains, on the original capital gains, nor would they pay them on any capital gains for anything that they invested in to develop, say for instance, this hotel. So kind of a real interesting uh, um, proposal. They were looking for city participation in probably SDC waivers. So to try to get the SDCs covered, but they uh, had a lot of interesting uh, things in regard to it. Uh, opportunity zones so that they would be looking to hire uh, local people. Um, they did say that they were signatories to uh, union um, con uh, union contractors. And uh, what was the other one? Yes, um, also uh, would attempt and provide funds for the city to um, have people uh, put on staff to um, go through their uh, permits, et cetera. So they would not expect the city to expend a whole bunch of money on additional staff for it. So real interesting, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, outside money there and, and not a real big ask for, uh, for the city. The second proposal, I'm gonna call it the soccer one, which was basically the uh, uh, soccer stadium. Um, uh, and then would also, that would be developed first then would be followed up with a hockey stadium and then a bunch of really interesting um, housing that surrounded that and businesses. That was a real interesting design that sort of fit the topography of the, uh, um, of the area and uh, was much less obtrusive than the giant hotel. But uh, that, so that was basically the discussion and there were a lot of questions from uh, the, uh, um, city council in regard to that, but they will be getting back and apparently having a 426, there will be a comeback that will include public and private sessions is what was said there. And oh, the other thing is that the city has hired apparently or will hire 
private legal and financial consultants to ensure that uh, Springfield is um, getting the best possible deal that they can out of this. If there's no uh, um, T's or I's that are crossed or dotted that are being are being missed that might uh, affect things. So it was a real interesting uh, uh, meeting the 20th. Thank you. Commissioner Gill. I mean, sorry. Yeah. Commissioner McGinley. Um, our calendar is open from the near future. So as soon as we get something on the calendar, I'll let you guys know. But it looks like we may have to cancel our May 4th one unless something comes up in the next couple of days. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah. And thank you for that update, uh, Commissioner Quibla. I know that was a long meeting. And I always appreciate getting the summaries uh, from this commission. I think with that, if nobody else has anything to add, uh, we have about seven minutes to spare. Um, so thank you, everybody. And we'll see you at some point soon, perhaps May 4th, perhaps not. Um, but I, we know we'll see each other soon. I hope you have a great night. And I hereby close this work session. Thank you.